super nice to meet you. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me. This is a pleasure. Yeah, you're you're super inspiring. Everything that you do uh, is um, really incredible, and uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to talk to you about it and have you share a little bit about your journey and your experience. And I think when I think about you, um, obviously I think about this incredibly talented ultra runner, but really uh, what you're about is so much more than that. And I think right now we can both agree that the country is very divided. Uh, There is a communication gap. There is this division that is separating us and our ability to communicate has broken down. Our communities are fractured and the path forward, the healthy path forward is to try to find a way to bridge that gap, to try to improve the health of our communication, right? To, to unite around uh, our shared value systems and, and, and beliefs. And, and you've really leveraged um, you're running to try to promote this message. And I think it's beautiful. The adage of uh, you can't know the world unless you know your, back, your backyard. <laughs> I don't know who originally said that. Did you know who, 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 who is, to whom is that quote attributable to? I, I, I know it wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said that, but yeah. you actually not only took it to heart, but put it into practice. And you're really um, more of an artist than an athlete in my mind, like you have used this medium uh, of running great distances to paint this canvas of humanity in a really beautiful way. So thank you for that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, and you know, I I knew about you for a long time and then really dived into what you were doing when you were were doing the San Francisco every single street thing. Um, And I knew that you would run uh, across America, but um, I didn't know that much about that until I started prepping for talking to you today. And you sent me a cut of the Transamerica um, film, which is really quite moving. So how did that come together? Uh, the film or the uh, well, the, let's, the trip itself. I mean, let's just talk. Mm. Let's talk about the trip, and then we can mm. kind of weave in the film. So the trip itself. Uh, two years ago, I ran across the country. I left on March first of. 2017 and finished on August 1st of 2017. So a five month trip. Mm -hmm. The idea behind it is that I've, you know, I've competed on a national and international level. I've traveled all over the world uh, pursuing this, this sport, this running, uh, mountain running, trail running, ultra running. And I was just kind of getting to a point in my career where I needed to, uh, I needed to explore what else uh, the sport really meant to me and what its potentials were. And that's kind of when I came to this realization that I knew so many more parts of the world than I do our own country. Mm -hmm. And uh, such a huge part of that, um, realizing, you know, as you just said, we have this breakdown in communication, you know, with this increase in, in, the the bubble effect, you know, it's becoming easier and easier to live within our own bubbles. Um, it just occurred to me that uh, such a huge problem of ours right now is that we're not talking to each other. Right. And what better way to do that, especially for someone in my position um, who can put in a lot of miles? I don't have the commitment of a family. Um, I've I you know I don't have the commitment of a, of a a, a nine to five job, a, uh-huh. a, a standard job per se. Um, what better way to really explore this than to uh, to do something that I've always wanted to do, which is to do a really big uh, trek. And uh, how how many years in the making was this? I think that I could say that it was uh, almost ten years, fifteen years uh-huh. in the making. Um, but, uh, you know, I, when I was 19 years old, I stopped going to college for a couple years. I, one of my goals during those two years off was to, uh, uh, to bike across the country. And so I saved up my money. I took the Greyhound bus up to Washington. I had this idea that I was going to bike around the entire United States, the circumference of the United States. I made it three days in and uh-huh. <laughs> thought that I had completely destroyed my knee. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, this is with a serious road bike with big gears. And um, 
60 or 70 pounds of gear with me. I completely destroyed myself almost immediately. So I packed up my bike. I sent it uh, to Colorado, and then I took my money and my time and went to Italy instead. Uh -huh. So that was 19, that was <clears throat> 18 years ago. Yeah, um, it's funny, like at the peak of your, you know, sort of physical powers as a young, strapping young man, you know, on a bike and you're, you make it three days. <laughs> totally, and, and <laughs> no, it's, it's just, like, uh, I mean, it's uh, the classic, uh, you know, you're, you, I, I was just not mature enough to pursue something right. like that. And, mm -hmm. and I just went way overboard. So it's been in my head since I was 19. I read a book when, or, or if not earlier, I read a book, uh, A Walk Across America. Oh, Peter Jenkins Totally, book. Yeah, yeah, when I was 17 or 18 or so. Uh -huh. And that really stuck in my head, just this man's ability to connect with people um, for no other reason than he's out there on foot, uh, putting himself in a vulnerable yeah. position. Yeah, he really kind of put that type of expedition on the map. His son Jedediah is a is a good friend. Has been on the podcast a couple of times. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's a he's an amazing writer. If you haven't yeah. read his his book, it's quite something. Yeah, and I, I haven't read that. I'll check it out. Um, so I'd been thinking about it for a while, and then very like the the real planning. Um, I thought about I would say for a year to two years ahead of time, mm -hmm. like if I'm gonna do this. Like how how am I going to make it work for me? Um, how would I want? Uh, like it's not something that I anticipate doing twice. If you're just going to do this once, how are you going to make it worthwhile? And and for me, that meant uh, really diving into what America is and what I am personally, right? And planning that beforehand. And so that means, you know, looking at all the all of the history of of the United States, how we uh, came to be who we are, um, you know, the, the this this westward expansion, this idea of manifest destiny, of dis, uh, you know, the, I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. This this idea that uh, you know we um, created this country, um, but we also we did a lot of bad in the process. And mm -hmm. so, you know, how can I um, pursue a, a, a massive feat like this? and touch upon all of those things at the same time. How much did uh, political news and the 2000, 2016 election play into the urgency to finally do this thing? So I had the date set in my head um, before the elections. I don't, I don't know why I picked March 1st. I needed a, uh, a round number. Um, uh -huh. So I went with, with that. Um, I knew that I was gonna hit weather at some point uh, during during my trip, whether that be snow, rain, or extreme heat. Um, so I had the date planned before the election. And like uh, many of us, um, I think on both the right and the left, uh, I thought the election was going to go a different way. And then come November 8th, November 9th of, of 2016, uh, when it did go the way that it did, uh, I knew that it was going to be way more interesting yeah. than I had anticipated. Did that influence the route? Because you you make this decision to to spend a lot of time in the South, and you go through you know mostly red states over the course of the whole journey. Well, it didn't influence the route so much, um, but I dare you to try and find a route across the yeah. United States where you're not going through a lot of red territory. Mm -hmm. And that's the nature of the country. And that's what I think a lot of us have learned over the past few years, um, especially when we're starting to look at the electoral college and all of these things is, you know, the uh, the center part of the, the country is huge. Yeah. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, there's a lot of space in between towns, but there's, there's a lot of space in general, which uh, accounts for a large population. Right. Um, so, it didn't influence my route all that much, but I did know uh, after the elections that it was going to be really interesting. I was going to be, you know, I, I wanted to go through the South um, because I've spent very little time in the South. Um, I was raised by parents who didn't necessarily have a prejudice against the South, but there was not a lot of urgency to bring us there. Uh -huh. um, my mom was a hippie in the 1960s. Yeah. She's a hippie today in 2019. Um, and I think in the 1960s, he had this, uh, uh, this common dialogue going on that, that warned, um, people from going to the South. 
Um, right. You know, you've got Easy Rider where, yeah. you know, you've got your protagonists uh, uh, and meeting their end there. And mm -hmm. and that's just, just one of a, a few different stories. So. Right. So you just got married, right? I just got married yeah. two and a half weeks ago. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's very cool. You've been with Liz for like seven or eight years or something like that. Almost a decade Almost at this a decade. point. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, but at the inception of, of this run, my sense is, and you allude to this sort of, you, you, you comment on it, but you don't spend too much time talking about uh, the fact that you're kind of going through a, a bit of an existential crisis perhaps about your relationship, but perhaps about things greater that motivated you to kind of take a break from your relationship and, and carve out this time for yourself. So what was going on with you kind of mentally and emotionally going into the run? It's something like to this day that I don't know that I can answer entirely um, other than it just seemed like a trip to me. It seemed like a part of my life and a trip to me where I needed to be on my own, uh -huh. and and I don't know really a better way to say that other than that I just it, I couldn't fathom really uh, thinking about anyone other than myself uh -huh. during this time. Yeah. In retrospect, I I thought a lot about other people, and especially Liz. Um, and so it's yeah it's it's a live and learn thing. I'm I'm glad that it uh, has turned out the way that it has, and and that I think that we both uh, learned a lot from from that break that we took. And uh, and yeah, it's it's uh, it was it was definitely a challenge. It was a challenge then, and and even looking back on it, it's it continues to be a challenge. Yeah. When you know when you um, put a little fracture in a relationship like that. Uh, you know, as as well as it as you can repair it, it's it's still there. Yeah. So it's it's something to for me for us to always think about, and for uh, me to be able to to tell other people as well. Right. You know, that's a, something that you know when people are having issues with their relationships, um, our tendency is to go inward rather than outward, and and I don't think we really talk enough about uh, about mistakes that we've made or issues that we've had, and. Uh, you know, I think that that's really important for for me to put that out there. Right, and there's something about running and that solitude that accompanies it that gives you the space and the capacity to kind of wrestle with those things and and get clarity for yourself. I mean, you have there's a monologue in the in the film. I think it's after you've left Aspen and you're in the you're in the snow and the in the Rockies where you say, you know, look, running was about competition for most of my life, measuring myself against others and a clock, but it's become a process of um, not just connecting with other humans, but a process of self-discovery. And that's like a huge theme in, in everything that you do and, and in this beautiful movie. Yeah, and I think that I think if most of us, most of us that do run or walk or bike or pursue something with consistency year after year, I think if we really look at what it's doing for us, I think that a lot of us will find the same things. Right. Um, and this is this is something that I tell people, uh, and and you know, running is has been my thing, but I I don't think that's necessarily the thing for everybody. I think that right. knitting knitting could be that thing, uh, crochet. Uh, you know, badminton, like I, I, I just think for me, I chose this activity 20, over 20 years ago, 25 years ago, uh -huh. and I've stuck with it for 25 years. And, and when you stick with something for that long, whether it's, it's an activity or a person, you're going to continue to learn so much more about that. But also, and more importantly, you're going to learn so much more about yourself. And right. this this thing just keeps changing and changing and changing. And it's that consistency that allows for that to to happen. Right. Um, so lots of people have run across America. Yeah. Uh, I just had Ro this guy Ravi Ballinger on the show who who did it last year. He did it in like 75 days. Um, my friend Mike Posner just walked across America. But most people that do this do it with an RV and a lot of support. Um, that, that, and that support tends to be off camera. Conveniently. Yeah. But you you decide to do this unsupported. And um, for 
a vast majority of the entire expedition, it's just you with a very light backpack and a tarp and a ground cloth and a little bit of food. And basically that's it. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I've, I've been at this sport for quite a while. Um, I wouldn't say that I have a huge following, but I do have people that are paying attention to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, it doesn't seem right to, uh, to put this project out there uh, in a way that I don't think is accessible to a normal person. And by that, I mean, I don't think most people can uh, pull together an RV in the funds uh -huh. uh, to pay for a person and gas and food for multiple people for months on end. Conversely, I do think that people, a lot of people, um, Ideally, if you're if you're younger and you have the physical capability, can put together the funds and the time to uh, to do it in the same way that I did. Right. And maybe you're not doing. <laughs> it's yeah. funny because there, there's a there's a little bit of an irony in there because you're like, mm. I'm going to do this super extreme thing to show that how doable it is for everybody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, and maybe not everybody, but I I do believe um, you know you've got several thousand people starting the Appalachian Trail these days. And I think the Appalachian Trail is awesome. Like, there's no doubt about it. But like, how much are you really going to learn about? You're going to learn a lot about yourself, mm -hmm. and you're going to learn a lot about trail culture. But how much are you really going to learn about the United States in this greater context? It's it's a form of escapism, and that's sometimes exactly what we need is to escape uh, what's going on outside of outside of our front door. But for me personally, like, I needed to. Uh, explore something a lot deeper right. than, than just myself and just, uh, you know, the the physical capabilities of something like that. So um, so I, I set a, a budget for myself. I, I did a $1,000 a month, um, $5,000 total for the five months. Wow. Um, I slept outside most nights. Uh, I'd, I'd get a hotel or a motel once once a week or once every 10 days uh, that increased uh, more towards like once every couple days towards the end as I started kind of losing it a little bit yeah. and simply needed to uh, go into a room and, and lock the door and turn the AC on mm. and, and turn some mindless television on. Um, but for the most part, what I wanted to do was to, to put it out there that this is something that yeah. um, people can do and that there's alternatives to these uh, to do in the Appalachian Trail or, or going to Europe for four months. Like you can just pack a very light backpack and and see what's out there. And, uh -huh. and it's it's really incredible when you, uh, you know, when people see that all you have is in your backpack and they ask you if you've got a gun, you know, to protect right. yourself and, and like, no, I don't have a gun. <laughs> um, to you know, just putting yourself out there in a vulnerable position, the amount of warmth mm -hmm. and generosity that I experienced was was something that I never could have anticipated in a million years. People yeah. giving me every last yeah. dollar from their wallet, yeah, yeah. you know. And there's the guy. What's his name? Jim gives Steele. You, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gives you eighty bucks or hundred. I said hundred eighty. It was. I, I said eighty. It was one hundred and sixty. Right. It was one hundred and sixty dollars and. And he the, wasn't taking no for an answer. No, it was amazing. It was, uh, and that's when I kind of realized, um, you know, that people in their own way want to uh, participate in this, yeah. in this thing. Um, a few years ago, so this is kind of something that I think about. And uh, the best way for me to, to tell this is, is to talk about someone else running across the country. And that was Pete Kostalnik who did uh, across the country in 40, I'm going to say 44 days. It could have been a little quicker. Um, this is in 2016. So a year before or a few months before I did mine, um, he did this and he was doing 60 to 70 miles a day for 44 right. days and broke the the record that had stood for unsupported. Uh, he that was very supported. That uh, was yeah, two or three would, RVs with several people. Yeah, it was a it was it was a big effort mm -hmm. on, for a lot of people and and he he's sure to give them credit as well. Yeah. Um, but for me personally, so I I was in Wisconsin at the time and I saw that he was going through northern Illinois and I got in my car and drove two and a half hours just to run with him for a few miles. Cause it's like, 
it just felt like it was seeing this mythical creature when someone's doing something like that. And even now to this day, like uh, now that I've done this big journey, like I still think it's a mythical creature. You're, it, it's right. like seeing a mountain lion or yeah. something. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and so uh, I, th I think that for me, that's what it, that's what it was for kind of when I came to realize that some people, when they, they wanted to give me money or just stop and talk, it was like, you know, it, it is something rare. Right, there's the one guy who, it looks like he turned his car around when he saw you and he got out and he's like, yeah. oh, my friend's gonna freak out. I read yeah. about you like when you crossed the state line or something like that. Yeah. So there was some awareness as you were passing through of yeah. what you were doing. Totally, in in certain areas. I don't know why right. it was in certain areas. Yeah. It was Oklahoma and Arkansas where I received the most amount of mm. generosity and warmth. Um, and then when I, Got to California, ironically, it was, it was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's interesting just, like yeah. that. Like I think what I appreciate most is mm -hmm. is you know there is a there's a vein of humility and vulnerability that that infuses you know this effort and the other things that you've done, and this Transamericana journey um, is almost like this um, uh, performance art piece that is part de Tocqueville, part Henry David Thoreau. Like I'm gonna light out on America and learn about democracy and connect with people to try to better understand them, better understand myself and better understand, you know, what is required to unite us and bring us together. Totally. And, I, yeah. and you took your time. Yeah. Like the priority wasn't the running, the priority was the connection. Yeah. And, and the funniest thing that I encountered or the most interesting thing that I encountered when I went across the country is that, like, I thought I would be talking politics all the time, mm. and it never came up. It was just like, you when when you're doing something like that, when people see something like that, they don't want to ask you what your political right. views are. They want to ask you about like what you're doing, what you're seeing out there, and 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 it just becomes really incredible that so much of this stuff just kind of dissolves away. Um, and, and you realize that, uh, and I think I say the same thing in, in the movie coming out, uh, is that I think we're, I don't think so. I know so we're way more similar than we are different. Yeah. It's, uh, I, th I think that we're 90% similar and 10% different And that 10% difference has become inflated so that we mm. think that it's 90%, but it's not. Right. It's exploited. Exactly. You know, and it's leveraged by the media mm -hmm. to further divide us. Totally. And, and uh, you know, I, I subscribe to my own media and, and a lot that's uh, been brought to my attention over the past couple of years with talk of fake news and all of these things is, is coming to terms with that the media that I pay attention to is also biased. Uh -huh. and, and it's not just Fox News, like NPR is also biased. We've all got these biases and, and you know, we like to think that we're right about uh, our convictions but the reality is, is that, uh, you know, there's a million different paths out there. Yeah. And if you grew up in Kansas and on a farm in Kansas and, and you had that lifestyle and, uh, you know, there's, the, I, I just see their voting habits, their convictions as every bit as valid as mine. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the, the biggest thing that, that I gained from, from my run across the country is, is coming to terms with that. Yeah. Did it change your, your media diet in any way? Did it expand like what you expose yourself to or contract that? Or, you know, what is the lingering kind of long-term impact? Because this was a couple years ago. Yeah. So you've had time to reflect. Totally. And have some objectivity on it. Um, it, it has, um, and let's see, how do I put this? It's, it's just made me pay attention to other forms of media and it doesn't necessarily, I don't necessarily uh, subscribe to them, but being aware that these, that Fox News is out there and that mm. this is where my dad gets his information and, um, and that if I can allow myself to believe that, um, you know, maybe NPR or whatever it is that I pay attention to, um, I don't necessarily believe this, but if, uh, if I can believe that NPR is, is just as biased as Fox News is mm -hmm. uh, based on, on, you know, our, our polarized convictions right. um, and, and the agenda behind them, then that's, uh, 
And that's what stuck with me from from that trip, yeah. at least in terms of of my attention to media. Right. So you start in South Carolina, and there's this great great scene where you sell your car for a thousand dollars, and then yeah. you have to pay her to give you a ride to the beach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she doesn't. She couldn't care less what you were doing. She yeah. seems totally disinterested and yeah. like unflappable about yeah. the whole experience. And, and there, it's very unceremonious how you begin. You kind of dip your toe into the ocean and then you're yeah. like, all right, I guess we're starting now. Yeah. And that's it. Totally. I mean, there's, yeah, I don't know. There's no real way to start a trip yeah. like that. And I don't, uh, I didn't want anyone there. I did have a videographer there, my, right. my friend Jared, um, <clears throat> with The Wandering Fever, who's making this film um, with Solomon. Uh, my main sponsor as as the backer behind it. Um, and I was grateful to have him. He rented a car. So after we sold that car, he rented a car and, and I had backup for the first six days, which was just right. really nice. It was a nice soft way to enter this journey. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's just crazy starting a trip like that. It's like you really do that, that, uh, um, that quote definitely emerges the, a trip of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And right. like that first step is just like, so wah, wah. Right. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. And then there's another step and <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just, I guess we're doing this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then you get to the end of the first day and like, I only did like 13 miles that day and I got completely fried, sunburned, fried. Uh -huh. And on for day one blisters, like sunburn, um, hungry, like everything. Right. And it's just like, wow, all right. All right, it's gonna be a long yeah. adventure. <laughs> totally. Um, well, it seemed like most of the most profound encounters that you had with human beings took place during that like tour of the South, like from South Carolina through Oklahoma um, is where you connected the most with people. And then mm -hmm. it's, then you kind of enter this you know phase where the expanses of nature begin to you know just get bigger and bigger and those encounters are fewer and fewer yeah. um and then like you're in aspen and you do a reset where you're home with your family and your friends and it almost felt like all the questions that you were asking of yourself and of others had kind of been answered at that point. Like every every intention that you went into this run, you know, in terms of like things that you wanted to solve for yourself or discover or learn had kind of been resolved and answered. Yeah. But yet you have this whole, <laughs> you know, actually the hardest part of the whole thing still remained for you to do. Was totally. there a moment where you were like, I don't need to get to California. Like I've kind of, satisfied myself here. There was, yeah, I would say that I, I can safely say that there was no moment where that actually occurred to me. Uh -huh. It was just kind of like, I don't know, it, it's like going down the Grand Canyon or going through the rapids or something. It's like you're halfway through the rapids and you're like, that was fun. But it's like, there's no, there's no getting out. Mm -hmm. There's no getting off the river. And that's, that was my mentality. Right. And I think it was in, in terms of completing the goal, that was the best mentality to have for my personal health and uh, my mental sanity, it probably wasn't the best, mm -hmm. um, but it, it did bring me to uh, a place that I, I couldn't have anticipated or gotten to otherwise. Yeah, And uh, I still think about it a lot uh, to this day, two years later, just like uh, the state of mind that I ended up getting into in, in the desert, yeah. in the depths of it, and just kind of uh, this this full emptiness of of self, and right. and you start to think about uh, other, you know, some some very big names throughout the course of human history who have tested themselves in the desert and for for long periods of time, and and growing up Catholic, uh, the first one obviously to come to mind is Jesus in the desert for, right. for 40 days. And I'm not overly religious anymore, but it's something that uh, I think about uh, in, in that sense is like, you know, how accurate uh, that story is or how much you wanna interpret that story. Like the body and the mind goes through some really serious changes mm -hmm. when you're in the desert for that long and you start to lose it a little bit and 
um, you just start to become really empty and your almost your ego is truly becomes dissolved and yeah and you just have this goal to get across it and and you start doing and not thinking and and it, it's it's a really beautiful thing well it's like a purification right exactly. it's like you've you've <laughs> traversed a huge section of the country you've been enriched through all these experiences that you've had and all these people that you've met along the way and now in order for you to become whole, we got to strip you down to your, you know, we're going to take you through this section of the country that is going to basically beat you down and burn you to a crisp until you, you're you forced to meet yourself in the most profound way that, that, that you ever have before. And then you can reassemble all these pieces and emerge from this experience like transformed. Totally. Really? Like it's, yeah. it's, it is biblical in a certain respect. And it's also this kind of, um, you know, hero's journey. Like yeah. you're not done yet. Now yeah. the final phase, we're gonna put you through this thing yeah. and see if you can weather this. Totally. And it's not permanent, which is uh -huh. uh, kind of a bummer. <laughs> that purification of the soul, if, if that's what we're gonna call it, it's not permanent. Yeah. And like you, I finished the trip and- Back to <laughs> resetting. <laughs> totally, you, it's like, all right, what do I before. do with, and, and this right. is where I'm, I'm curious to talk uh, you know, or listen to to other people that have gone through uh, similar sort of things. Like, how how do you put your life together after this? You're not going to keep walking forever. Um, and and it's it's funny. I, uh, you know, of course, any you tell anybody that you went across the country on on foot, and and nine times out of ten, they they'll say, oh, you like Forrest Gump. Right. And and of course, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, Forrest. Okay, that was that was a movie, but yes. But there is this scene in the movie where he just like you can see it's like it's very real. Like he he has purified himself and uh -huh. and he just stops in the desert and he says he, he's done. He's uh -huh. going home. Right. It's like there's nothing else to <laughs> yeah. to be done. I f figured I found everything that yeah. I was looking for. Yeah. Right. And it, I, like it gives me goosebumps right now. It's kind of funny to think about Forrest Gump even after I've I've done that and uh, to to recognize those similarities uh -huh. and uh, just, and the, the astuteness of the film itself in putting that in there. Right. And just ha like not labeling it overtly, but having it there and just seeing like he was, he was done. Like he, uh -huh. there was nothing, there was nothing more to be gained from, from that journey. Right, mm -hmm. but you were not in the desert and you did not have that epiphany in no. that moment. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it is it is most people's only frame of reference totally. for anything that you're doing. And rather than be annoyed by that, like yeah. to be able to embrace it and say, actually, that was profound. Yes, yeah. I am I am retracing those steps in that way yeah. on this journey, Yeah, which is cool. Mm -hmm. Of all the um, encounters that you had along the way, w what are the ones that that stick with you? Um, so there was that one, uh, this is in the film, Jim Steele, um, who literally emptied out every dollar of his wallet and gave it to me. And, um, that was quite profound. That was in, uh, Arkansas on a particularly miserable day. I could remember, like I was in between two towns. One was called Quitman. I, I suppose you would pronounce uh -huh. it Quitman. <laughs> uh -huh. And the other was, I forget what the other town was, but it was like, in a day where if I was really paying attention to the, what the, uh, the universe was, uh, telling me to do, it was telling me to quit, man. Uh -huh, and, right. uh, this guy is, uh, pulls up and, and, uh, just as he said in the spirit that it's given, just gave me every dollar out of his pocket. Was he driving along the road and he stopped? Was, yeah, he d was driving along the road and, and, uh, pulled up alongside of me and saw me with my backpack and my beard and, and asked if I was running across the country. And uh, he said, I want to talk to you. Uh -huh. And he was up ahead another uh, 200 meters. And, and we just had a short conversation. But um, I think it was equally as impactful for both of us. Mm. Another one was in the middle of the Nevada desert. Um, there's this uh, on Highway 50 in Austin, Nevada. There's this bar there called the Serbian Christmas Bar or something like that. And there's this... Uh, a Serbian man that that runs the that owns the restaurant, and uh, it was it was just funny to find an article written about him. They were the article was about Highway 50, but then it focused in on this man, and I found this article and 
and just talking about how racist and terrible of a human being this guy is. And, and uh, so went in there and had a, several beers with him and, and had a great time and uh, heard his perspective and, and tried to take it in as best I could. But, uh, you know, still in the end, uh, walked away with a new friend. Mm. Um, gosh, there was so many along the, uh, so I did a, a, a section of rivers. So I, you were asking like kind of how this, how I came up with, uh, the idea of this run or, and one of the things like, so I, I did about a thousand miles of trail, um, to 2,500 miles of, uh, of road and, uh, 300 miles of river. I did the Tennessee right. river going across Alabama in the spirit of, of American westward expansion. Mm -hmm. It's very Huckleberry Finn. Yeah, Huck Finn and also uh, Lewis and Clark. Lewis uh -huh. and Clark did about a thousand miles of river, up river. They went up, uh, I believe the Mississippi and then to the Missouri. They went up the, the Missouri quite a ways before setting off on land. Uh, but just trying to get a feel for that, uh, you know, when you can take advantage of, of water, you do. And so I was going down the river for a couple days and, um, or at that point, three or four days, and I uh, just about to cross into Alabama, and uh, needed to get some food from uh, Pittsburgh, Tennessee, South Pittsburgh, Tennessee, and pulled onto this private dock, and almost I've got my wet sleeping bag out, my uh -huh. paddleboard up on on this dock, and this fancy car drives up right then, and I'm like, oh gosh, this is the the landowner, and sure enough, it was, and. And uh, he had read an article that was published in uh, the M Memphis, Tennessee, I can't remember the name of the, uh, uh, or sorry, Chattanooga, Tennessee, I can't remember the name of the newspaper, but he just comes up to me and he says, are you that skinny boy running to, to San Francisco? And I said, yes, sir, I am. He's like, I'm taking you to supper. <laughs> and so we get in his car and, and he drove me into town. He's the uh, fourth generation, uh, CEO owner of ca of Lodge Cast Iron mm. the 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 skillets mm. and uh, took me all over town towns about a thousand people right. um, introduced me to the entire staff in the office they all thought I was a bit kooky um, but he <laughs> this guy is like mid seventies and and just like you could tell was a total character uh -huh. and just wanted to talk about rivers and and how he, he's uh, coming to the end of his, his time at the, uh, at the company and, and he's going to go start doing big river trips. And, wow. and so that was really awesome. And so he give you a bed to sleep in that night? No, I had to keep going. <laughs> yeah. I would have, he would have, and I would have right. taken him up on it, but I, I, uh, I, it was midday. Right. And so I needed to keep going and he pulled out a hundred dollars out of his pocket and said, can I give this to you? And I said, I, you know, I really don't need it. I saved up my money and, mm. and, uh, 75 years old, the guy gives me knuckles and he's like, right on. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like mm. you're this Western manifest destiny version of the Buddhist ascetic, you know, who, mm. who basically is relying on the kindness of strangers to survive. Yeah. yeah. Did you, did, were, did, were there, opportunities to where people were opening up your, their homes and letting you crash there for the night and stuff like that. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one in particular memorable one was in, uh, on the Osage reservation in Oklahoma, um, Northeastern Oklahoma. And I had gotten to this town, uh, space in the name of the town right now. Um, but got there was buying a, a couple beers at the, uh, the store and this guy uh, behind me in line, uh, he, he I, uh, that's what it was. I was asking the, uh, the clerk, because I had spent the previous night out in the rain, and I just, I wanted a, a nice dry spot to sleep. I wasn't looking for uh -huh. anything other than a dry spot. And, uh, and she's like, yeah, I don't know, the bridge over there, is, it's okay, but I think it's pretty rocky there. And and this guy behind uh, behind me in line, he just looks at me and he says, uh, you're, you're not going to, so long as you don't steal anything and you don't go into my brother's room who owns the place, uh, you can stay with me, <laughs> brother man. 
and he had a 12 pack of beer and, uh-huh. and, uh, we went back to his place and talked for the next four and a half hours. Wow. And, uh, I can't imagine the set of circumstances that would have to arise for me to invite like a stranger who's in line with me at some store back to my house yeah. to, to crash. You yeah. know what I mean? Like we've lost that. Maybe that's a small town thing and it yeah. seems like a small gesture, but that's kind of a big thing. It is a big thing. Yeah. And it was, uh, in, in, I, I, it seems to me that I encountered that way more like that sort of generosity. I encountered uh-huh. that way more in the South and then less so as I got into the right. West. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that uh, says about us or about the yeah. South, or I mean, maybe what do you, it's still What do you make of America? <laughs> yeah. What is your summation? So, I mean, after that trip, I, th- I thought America was great and yeah. I still do to, to this day. And it, it definitely, uh, um, yeah, it, it, it rekindled uh, this love that I, that I have for this country. And, and uh, I just think that, I mean, I'm not going to go out preaching to everybody to go run or walk across the country, but um, running across our our county or or whatever it is, uh, you know, can can do a lot. Well, we not everyone's going to run across America. Very few are, but mm-hmm. everybody has the ability to more profoundly connect with their neighbors. Totally, you know? and I think that's that's what I take away from it. That there are all little things that we can do every single day to try to bridge this divide a little bit better than we have. And I think such a huge part of it is like physically getting out there and meeting people. And Mm -hmm. it's really uncomfortable. Like initially it's really uncomfortable. Well, you have the ultimate icebreaker. It's like when you open up with like, this is what I'm doing, like everyone's gonna wanna talk to you. Totally. But you strike me, it's not like you're this this super outgoing person. Like you're Mm -hmm. you're kind of a quiet guy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, was that uncomfortable for you to, be that open and vulnerable and and like roll up on strangers when you're passing through? It wasn't, uh, you know, going back to this this myth of the mountain lion when, when, I mean, you really start to embody that. Like you really start to feel like you are something special, mm-hmm. um, even though it's, it's, uh, it's not lasting for that long. It's just lasting for uh, the few months that you're doing it. And then, you know, when it's done, it's something that you have done. It's no longer something that you are doing. Yeah. So while you are doing that thing, I found that it was really quite easy for me to, you know, to go into a bar and and kind of puff up my chest right. and say, I'm I'm running across the country. Who's buying me a beer? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of free beers, I would imagine. Totally. Yeah. 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 Um, so. Yeah, and then when, and then when it's over, you that's that's where the real work I think begins, uh, at least for. Uh, the 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 individual right. is like, what do you do with this thing that you have done that you are no longer doing? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know if you think of yourself or call yourself an artist. I certainly do. Um, and and you know, part of being an artist, the definition of art and being an artist is to um, perceive the world through your unique lens and then translate it. Um, using some form of medium to elucidate a greater truth about humanity or the world, mm-hmm. right? And that can come in a variety of forms. It, be, it can it can be in the analog, like encounters that you're having when you're running across America, but you do it in many ways. Like you're very much a storyteller through photography, through film, through your, I mean, the writing on your website. I'd never been to your website before. Mm-hmm. Your website is super cool. Like it, the way it's I mean, it's laid out so minimally and beautifully, but everything that you've written on it and the visual aesthetic of it, like it speaks to that artistic sensibility and the storytelling aspect of, of what you've done is super important. And I, I, I'm sure there's no, it's no mistake that that this film, you know, still hasn't come out two years since you've done the run, like mm-hmm. the amount of work to try to get it right and tell the story that you want to tell. Totally. And uh I'm, I'm looking over at this book here that you have, mm. Open Water, uh, published by Chronicle Books. I'm going to shamelessly oh, promote yeah. that I've got a book coming out about this as well. Oh, you do? Cool. By Chronicle. Oh, good. Um, when is that happening? Time, uh, spring, April 2020. Oh, good. Then I can corral you to come back here. And wonderful. And talk about it <laughs> yeah, some more. Perfect. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, that, and, and I had both the film and the movie in mind uh, before I started this trip, and that's... It was it was part of my packing 
It was like, I want to be able to, like, I don't want to just do this for me. I'm doing this for uh, a lot of people that don't have the ability, whether it's physically, uh, whether it's money, mm -hmm. whether it's family, time, any number of things. Like, how do I, how can I share this with as many people as possible in, in as positive of a way as possible? Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if I've totally embraced uh, the title of artist yet. I think that I, um, I mean, I studied sociology and photography in school and, uh -huh. and with photography, certainly you talk a lot about art. Um, it's, it's such a technical, uh, pursuit that you're oftentimes talking about technique rather than, uh, the meaning behind, uh, all of, all of what you're shooting. Um, but that element has always been there for me. And, yeah. and, um, and your I wife's just, an artist. She is, yeah, very and much so. And now you so. live in like an artist collective totally. in Santa Fe. So yeah. just embrace yeah. this moniker, <laughs> Ricky. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, sh I'll shift my, uh, my resume around. <laughs> uh, um, well, when I'm watching the movie, I'm thinking about the logistics of how you pulled this off. Not just, not the, not, in addition to the run, like how you managed um, the workflow of like, capturing all of this. I would imagine yeah. a lot of it's on iPhone, but you had cameras with you and I'm thinking, how many SD cards did he bring and how is yeah. he keeping the batteries charged? And you know, what is he doing with all the footage to make sure that it doesn't get wet and ruined and yeah. all that kind of stuff? Well, I went through, I destroyed, uh, I think at least two and I think probably three Sony RX 100s. Uh -huh. I'm surprised they still give me the, uh, the insurance deal on them because I, Buy those at a thousand bucks a pop and and a hundred yeah and a hundred bucks on the insurance yeah. and they never last me for more than six months but they're uh -huh. they're great cameras, um, chest mounted GoPro and then uh, the iPhone and um, yeah it was just kind of funny uh, at times there like you know when I've got literally several weeks of footage uh, on my person like right. it, it no longer is anything worth anything except for those those right. cards there. And you must, are they in Ziploc bags and super, like how are you protecting no. all that stuff? Yeah. No. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Well, you had, I mean, there's a lot of beautiful cinematography and incredible drone shots and the like. So mm -hmm. you had a crew that would like drop in for short periods, right? Totally. So I had disappear. Jared, uh, so with the Wandering Fever, Dean Leslie and, and his wife, Hannah, um, are they're an incredible artistic couple that uh, have done most of Solomon's running films over mm -hmm. the past eight or nine years. I've worked with Dean on a whole bunch of projects. We've been on five different continents together. And so this was definitely an, a new route for us, for me to shoot a lot and just hand that over. Uh -huh. And then uh, and then he sent out uh, his assistant, uh, Jared, to to join me for, for uh, at the beginning for one week and then in the middle in Colorado for three weeks and into the desert and then at the end for four days. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, uh, yeah, you're just kind of keeping your fingers crossed that you're getting everything. Um, for me personally, it was a challenge to, you know, on the worst of days to pull out the camera and, and point right. it at myself and, and talk, to, talk uh -huh. to myself or talk to an audience. Um, when I'm feeling borderline crippled uh, to set the camera up and run back and forth in front of the camera. Yeah, a there's couple a couple times. times where I was like, he put the camera there and then totally. went back and ran by it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, some some outtakes uh -huh. would be hilarious. The the camera uh -huh. falling to the ground and right. Yeah. Um, but I was yeah, having now seen the evolution of the film, I I I'm grateful for uh all that we did uh put into it. Were there times it has to be awkward at times when you're having these encounters with people to pull out a camera and, and say, Can I document this? Yeah, it was awkward at times. People, I only got turned down twice. Uh -huh. Yeah, and people were were pretty chill about it. I think they appreciated again what I was doing, and and uh, you know they'd ask what it's for, and I say, well, I'm, I might make a movie about this, but really, I just want to remember the people mm -hmm. that I'm meeting along the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what's the plan with the movie? I mean, as of today, it's not it's not out publicly yet. Yeah, well, uh, keeping our fingers crossed, it's been submitted to a couple of the 
the bigger independent film fests here in the States. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would, that's kind of the ultimate goal right. is, is to see it on the big screen in, cool. in Austin or in, uh, in New York city. Uh, um, so nice. yeah, if any of you guys are out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's an hour and 15 minutes or something yep. like that. So a little bit shorter than a typical, um, nonfiction documentary, right. but, but much longer than anything you'd done prior. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about um, run every, the run every street thing. Yeah, because the 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 trans Americana was taking this very thin line across America. Um, in many ways, uh, you know, just circumstances dictating that you have to keep it somewhat on a surface level. And the running every street in San Francisco thing, which really put you on the map and created like a media frenzy, was a different version of that that allowed you to go deep, right? Yeah. To like more immerse yourself in your community on that same theme of, you know, you can't know the world unless you know, you know, your neighborhood. And mm -hmm. you're like, I live here, like, let me learn this. Totally. And people think of San Francisco as a relatively small city. Yeah. <laughs> that is not the case if you're gonna run every street. Totally. So how did that idea come to you? So that, that actually came to me almost immediately after running across the country. So Liz and I uh, got back together. We got back together as I was running across mm -hmm. the country. Um, we started discussing, you know, where's next. Uh, she was. We were in Wisconsin where she was doing her MFA program, and and she had a a couple great job prospects in San Francisco. And and I can again kind of live anywhere. So I uh -huh. um, I signed up for that, and we moved uh, back to the Bay Area. And, uh, and it was really kind of in my recovery time from running across the country where, uh, I was sitting up in the, the Berkeley Hills, um, at this really cool house that we had, uh, scored for, for the summer and out on the porch there where you're looking at everything from Mount Tam to Sausalito, Golden Gate Bridge, uh, the Bay Bridge, downtown San Francisco, you're looking down the peninsula, you're looking at Oakland and Fremont, you know, you've, you've got a view of a population of 2 million people and so much mm -hmm. commerce, so much transportation coming and going. Really, it was, I'm not gonna call it the opposite of my experience uh, that I had just done going across the country, but in terms of the space and the solitude that I had experienced doing 40, 50 miles a day running across the country, it was, so dense and still so completely foreign to me. Uh -huh. um, you know, to have had such a massive experience, uh, such as running across the country, and then look it down at this human hive of two million people, and kind of realizing that, like, my experience was so limited with what I had just mm -hmm. done. And that if you really want to get to know uh, a country, a place, um, like this is such a critical part of it as well is is getting to know the densest part, the the place where where humans yeah. actually congregate in mass. And so that's when I'm looking at that, and and I'm like, well, I, all right. So how many how many miles of street are there in San Francisco? Uh -huh. Like if if you're, you know, it's it's a reasonably. Uh, it's a compact city. It's got uh, very strict borders. Um, it's a seven by seven mile square. Um, and you know, I start so I started doing my research. How many miles uh -huh. are there? And I think it said eleven hundred and fifty miles of street, or eleven hundred miles of street in San Francisco. And so I'm like, okay, that's from approximately Denver to San Francisco. Uh -huh. Like I know how far that is. I know how long that could potentially take me. Um, like, what would that be like? And then more research, I find that uh, uh, San Francisco Chronicle uh, writer, uh, jur uh, journalist uh, had done He'd exactly that. Yeah. yeah, he walked it over about seven years time and wrote like two or three different articles mm -hmm. about it. And uh, and I was immediately inspired. And I'm Did like, you get I, in touch with that guy? I tried my very best sleuthing ever. I, I called, his name is John Graham, and I called probably 10 different John Grahams. Uh -huh. And not one Just of them. Just cold call? Cold call, yeah. <laughs> like it was like, like book I, style? Totally, it was. It was <laughs> like, 
And I even contacted the Chronicle. I contacted a lot of people and tried to, and he'd moved to a different part of California. And, and so I looked for him there and like his age, I never, never wow. talked to him. I'd still love to talk to him. I, uh-huh. I, I don't know if he knows um, that. I'm sure he knows now. I would hope so. It's like, yeah. cause it is very inspiring and, and his writings on it were, ended up becoming very similar to, to my impressions. Right. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I, I wanted to um, take the same approach, but do it um, ultra runner style and just massive miles every day uh-huh. and, and, uh, and see, you know, cause if, if he's, if he took seven years to do it, a city can completely change in seven years, yeah. especially a city like San Francisco. And you gotta start over and do it again. Totally. <laughs> and, but what's, what's, if you can do it in, in six weeks or two months, Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like you're getting a, a snapshot of that place at that moment in time. Right. Um, just looking at the grid of San Francisco, when you were embarking on this, I thought like, well, first of all, like how do you even figure out how you're gonna do this route and do it in a sane, like well-planned manner? Yeah. And I realized like that's a super complicated equation to solve. But yeah. when I started digging into it more, getting ready to talk to you today, I realized, oh, it's even way more complicated than I would have imagined. And you sought out the advice or the counsel of like a friend of yours who was a professor, right? Who yeah. like works in computer mapping or something like that to yeah. help you figure out like the best way to approach this. Yeah. And so we, we have 70 emails back and forth from each other from my run of San Francisco. Uh-huh. I, it, was, I was, it was every single day I was uh, communicating with him. Uh, his name's Michael Odi. We were on the cross country team together in, in high school. Uh, he's, he's a brilliant human being. And he loved the idea that I was, that I was going uh-huh. for this, like a literal human guinea pig for this equation that he's been thinking about before I even mentioned it to him. Um, and in the end, I used very little of his information. Oh, really? Yeah. Because, and, for, and it wasn't because his information was bad. It was because of so many different variables, like you, like translating the equation into usable terms for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, And so like, how do you do that? You put it in Google Maps or you put it in, like there's this app called uh, Map My Run or let, uh, I forget what they're called, um, but they actually can talk to you uh, from your phone, like take a left here at the end of this block, Mm -hmm. turn around and uh, it's San Francisco's too dense for that to actually work, for it to be, uh, for it to to work seamlessly. Mm -hmm. And so, or, you know, if you got off the route, so it would program a 10 mile uh, loop is what they call it because you are starting and finishing in the same place, Mm -hmm. even though it doesn't look at all like a loop. Mm -hmm. Um, If you got off your loop at all, you're on mile two, and then like only one block away, you might be on mile five. Uh, the equation would skip those three miles and just, uh, and so, but then it would ruin my entire plan for the right. day. And so I ended up just, I found that it was for me personally, it was easier to to have a map in my hand and kind of figure out my route throughout uh-huh. the day. And it was like, it, it actually became kind of fun. Like I'm not a, uh, a puzzle person, like crossword puzzles or the Rubik's cube. I've never solved, solved a Rubik's cube in my life. Um, but when you, when it when it gets translated into running terms, and you're actually running this crossword puzzle or this Rubik's cube, and if you do it well, then it'll take you 25 miles. If you do it poorly, it's going to take you 28 miles. Uh-huh. Like at the end of a 25 mile day, those three extra miles <laughs> that's a, that's a big are thing. is huge incentive <laughs> yeah. for you to get this problem right. Uh-huh. And so it was, uh, it became really exciting, and I got really good at it. Yeah, you have to be this cartographer, urban archaeologist yep. to solve it. And it's interesting that so so this professor was like crunching algorithms to solve it, but ultimately you you went more a little bit more on like feel and tactile printed out maps and things like that. Totally. And and like there's just a lot of things that like that he couldn't possibly account for. Um and, and like, some of like those, you can't park your car, your van there for all day or something totally. Like that. That's yeah. one thing you yeah. can't park your car there, or you know it would make sense um, for for the sake of the algorithm 
to go across this street and do like two or three blocks in a different neighborhood, and which uh, you would therefore not have to do on a different day, mm-hmm. but it would ruin the entire feel of 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 that day. Like mm-hmm. you're very much like a huge street like market uh, going down the center of San Francisco. Like staying within an, like a sub ecosystem. Exactly. And not crossing into a different kind of like cross section of humanity. That's so a very good do, way to right, put it. Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah. And so, and so I didn't I didn't really want to do that. And so he would figure out, you know. So this is those seventy emails back and forth. Uh-huh. Is, is him not just figuring out a good algorithm, but figuring out what Ricky wants. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And so you were you sleeping in your van at night, or were you going home up to the Berkeley Hills? Uh, so I ended up sleeping in. So I've. Uh, Long story short, uh, a couple European friends came over to the States uh, wanting a van. I helped them buy a van. Uh I had no intention of using this van. I was just going to sell it when they left. And when they left is when this project started. And that's when I realized, like, this is going to save me. Yeah, this is going to save me two hours a day Uh of driving when I'm going to be extremely tired. Um, And I, like, didn't want to deal with traffic. And right. so I ended up sleeping in my van for most of it. And uh, Liz would come into the city and <laughs> camp out in the city, you know, in uh-huh. the you know, urban camping. I, right. I, I, I should have, and I probably still can come up with an amazing map of the best camp spots in San Francisco in proper. <laughs> like places where you can be up on a hill and with your door open, looking at stars and, and the city skyline and uh-huh. completely safe. and. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a really cool part of it. And then of course, just being able to, um, to, to end my day, you know, right there and then start the next day right there. And you never had to worry about hydration or food, right? Did you just go into restaurants and eat or how did you manage like the, the calories? Almost entirely restaurants. Uh Yeah. In, in Chinatown, it was, uh, yep. Chinese food and, in the sunset, it was Vietnamese and, and pho, and in the mission, it was tacos, lots of tacos. Right. And yeah, and I never, I, I again carried uh, two different cameras with me in order to be able to document all of it. So I had the Sony RX100 and then a, a little GoPro, um, uh, and then my cell phone. So I guess I had three cameras. Yeah, and we should say Solomon made a film out of that called Every Single Street. Was it the same people that worked on the Transamericana? Totally, yeah, The Wandering Fever, Uh yeah. Um, And it was was a really fun film to work on, uh, just kind of, it was different than going across the country um, cause you know, we were talking about how I, when I was running across the country, like I didn't even have to tell people, or if I did want to tell people, right. then, you know, it was like, people were immediately interested in what I was doing. This was completely the opposite, you know, <laughs> like I, I don't, cares? yeah, exactly. <laughs> who cares? Exactly. Uh-huh. Um, you know, but, you know, but your ability to interact with people is a hundredfold higher. Yeah. Like you're just surrounded by people the entire time. Totally. So what were those encounters like? Like how did how, what was similar and what was different about the interpersonal, you know, encounters experiences that you had? Yeah, they were a lot shorter. They weren't I'll, I'll admit they for the most part they weren't as deep. Um it's just the nature of living in mm-hmm. a city and that's part of what I wanted to to discover on on something like that is you know the the city you're just packed like it's constant stimulation and that's people that's cars that's noise it's food like all of these things it's stuff you would have killed for when you were running mm-hmm. across the desert totally yeah. yeah with the exception of like you know the 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 lack of intimacy and i think that uh that speaks a lot to what a city is um a lot of people for me personally like if i want to go get lost like i go out into the mountains and that's my that's my quiet spot that's where i go to be by myself for a lot of people, that space is the city. Mm-hmm. Like that's, uh, they appreciate the anonymity of being in the city and and how nobody, nobody really looks at you, nobody really cares. You know, I think that's really a safe place for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, but flip, also lonely and alienating. Totally, yeah, that's the flip side of that coin. And so it's, uh, um, so yeah, it was, uh, I would say my most powerful interactions uh, with people in San Francisco were uh, were homeless people, and 
And I think a huge part of that was this dedication on, on my part. Um, I'm can be just as guilty of this as the next person. And that's to ignore, uh, this problem. Um, but when you're running certain streets in San Francisco, um, dead end street in the middle of Soma, like there is absolutely no reason to go to the end of that dead end street unless mm -hmm. you're going there to, uh, to shoot up and then pass out. Mm -hmm. And so when I find myself there and there's people there, uh, what are you going to do? Say, Hey, how you doing? Mm -hmm. And they, they look at you looking at them and, and you, and you can have a conversation. Maybe you don't, uh, I, I never felt, uh, in, in danger by any means. I, I certainly have it on my side that I'm, you know, a uh, young white male. Um, you well, know. a guy in running shoes isn't very threatening. Totally. It's not like an yeah. alarm bell sounding right. off, um, yeah. if you're running around. But you know you're you're putting yourself in precarious situations. Yeah. But never any you never had any brushes with danger. No. Yeah. It was uh, yeah maybe like on on my final day, running through the tenderloin in in San Francisco like eight or nine o'clock at night. Um, this guy I came around a corner and and he like threw a fake punch at me uh -huh. like at my face and just stopped right short, and he he was just sizing me up. Uh -huh. That was like his, and and when when he saw that I didn't I didn't even flinch, and the reason that I didn't flinch is because I had just run forty eight or forty nine miles that day, <laughs> and I was completely exhausted, yeah. and like I don't think it really would have mattered to me if he'd have knocked mm -hmm. me out. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that would that probably would have been a nice end to that day. Um, he just he just said, "All right, man." <laughs> well, in part inspired by by. Um, that expedition. I, I spend, I've told the story before, but I spend half the week in downtown LA because I've got a daughter that goes to a high school down there and it's too far to commute on the daily. Um, and I'm used to running in the trails around here. Yeah. And I kind of took it upon myself. Like I've lived in Los Angeles for over 20 years, mm -hmm. but until last year, I would rarely go downtown. There's just no reason to. And there's you know, as you know, Los Angeles is sprawling, it's gigantic, and there's very little, uh, there's huge patches of it that I've never been to and know mm -hmm. nothing about. And so um, I've taken it upon myself to better connect with my environment. And when I do my runs downtown, it's it's all city streets, and I try to take different routes, and I'll go through, like we're right on the, the edge of Skid Row. So I always run through Skid Row, and I'll run around MacArthur Park, which are places that you know everyone will tell you don't don't go there, mm -hmm. and I found the people, you know, to be like really friendly. Mm -hmm. And these are people with not, they're living in tents on the street, you yeah. know. And I get high fives, and they recognize me now. And like, yeah. there's like a friendly kind of like rapport there. Whereas when I go on the trails around here, like I'll wave to somebody running on the trail, and they don't even wave back, right? You know, and I'm like, that's not right, 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 right. You know, there's so much to be learned if we can set aside our fears and our judgments and and open ourselves up a little bit. Not to say that I've done anything like what you've done, I've just had a small taste of that. Yeah. What that experience must be like. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know what the benefit is, um, but I know that there is a benefit to stepping outside of our comfort zones and looking people in the eye. And and I think it's it, it works both directions. I think that it, uh, makes those people feel more human. You know, when you're sleeping on the street in the middle of uh, down, downtown LA, mm -hmm. and you, you can feel less and less like a human. And it makes you and me feel more human as well and, and uh, tap into this empathy um, that, that I think can go a really long way in, our, yeah. in this time in our society and um, something that perhaps we're losing a little bit and, and it's a good way to, to kind of gain it back a little. We need more empathy. More empathy. We definitely need yeah, more em empathy absolutely. and humility, yep. I think, yep. are, are, are keystones for a better future. Absolutely. Um, one of your main goals or the impetus behind the, the Trans Americana run was to inspire people to help them realize like, hey, this is, this is doable, $1,000 a month, that whole thing. But um, did you, but kind of ironically, the, the run every street thing has been the template 
that has been copied and emulated by, you've created like a social movement now. There are people <laughs> all over the world who are doing their version of what you've done. And there's news articles about it. Like that guy, there was a guy in Scotland, I think, mm -hmm. who was a kickboxer who then did, he tried to do what you did in his own town. Mm -hmm. So that has to be really cool to see kind of like the, the ripple effect of that. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's so like, I, I, I don't follow much on social media, but I do follow the every single street hashtag. Uh -huh. And it's just so cool to be able to see, uh, like on like outwardly, they're not the most amazing photographs uh, or or accomplishes accomplishments on a day to day basis, but you keep kind of going through these and you're you're realizing like no, you're just seeing a normal person's version of where they live. I mean, you're fertilizing these seeds that are that are planting the fruit of greater connectivity and community. Because the, the more people that are doing that, the more connected they are. Like they're having their version of your experience, which is uniting people and bringing them together. Totally. There was, yeah. a pit, there was an article about a group in, in Vancouver that did every trail in Stanley Park, right? Yeah. I didn't realize that it was like, 24,000 kilometers of trail in that that's park. That's incredible. <laughs> and they were gonna do every trail and there's a yeah. big group photo of all of them together. Yeah. Like that's gotta be amazing to see yeah. that. Yeah, it's awesome. There's there's one in, there's a guy doing it in Brazil and, for, and uh, just seeing the maps of the, I think this is like, it's, you know, some of these ideas they have to, you know, we have to wait for that idea, for everything to come together for that idea to work. Mm -hmm. And right now our technology is is what is a big part of what's allowing uh, this project to take off. And I think the hunger and the thirst that people have to be more connected. Yep, right? absolutely, yep. On top of that, there are all these people doing art projects on the the graphing, like the mapping part of it too. Yeah. Like you've been sharing those on Twitter, like people totally. that, like these little like I don't know what you call them, like motion graphics of yeah. like seeing the street, you know, the, like this the, like this map street art kind of thing. Yeah, and it's it's sort of organic, but like organic on a human level, which like one like won an award or something. Yeah, yeah, totally. So this is a, a gentleman in France. Um, who uh, I gave him all of the data from from my project, and he digitalized the entire thing. Uh -huh. um, so that was just for for my data the, and the stuff that's out there. There's a guy in Zurich doing every single street in Zurich, and and he's got some really cool uh, graphics going along with that. But mm. um, just the ability to wear a watch or wear your phone, and then to have the uh, this strange looking map of what you've accomplished during that during the day mm -hmm. um, to be able to uh, show like, you know, here's your photos of, of uh, the stuff that you saw. And then here's this strange looking map. Yeah. Um, and it, and it looks way different. It, it looks way, a 10 mile run in the city where you've got this goal to cover all of the streets in the, a small area can look so much more impressive uh, just on a graphic level yeah. than a hundred mile point to point run. Yeah. Because one's just a line and the other is this very intricate, uh, detailed, um, both accomplishment of a run, but also accomplishment of human society and that yeah. they created those streets and, and why are the streets in that shape? Uh -huh. I feel like you should also do like a Toshin style coffee table book with the <laughs> photographs and kind of the, the graphics of the mapping and yeah. all of that, that tells the story in a more visual way. Yeah, working on it. Oh, you are? Every, yeah, every, single, are. every single street See, you're an artist. <laughs> oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I nabbed man. that up right away. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I like that, man. Yeah. How do you, uh, how do you like make your life work? Like you live a very, you are, I mean, to me, you're the definition of a minimalist. Like you keep your overhead really low. You keep your life, um, uh, you conduct your life in a way that allows you to do the things that, that, that you love and you have sponsors that support you and all of that. But like, what does it look like on a daily basis? Um, sometimes it's really exciting. Sometimes it's so mundane that it's depressing. Uh -huh. um, like having running, like I'm, I'm very fortunate uh, to have running as part of my daily routine. Um, and I would say less so than it was 10 years ago. I, I, I used to be obsessively like need to run every day. Mm -hmm. And now that's a little bit less. And, and I'm realizing that uh, 
the less I run, if, if I don't have that routine, then uh, that the, the sooner that existential <laughs> uh-huh. crisis comes in. And, and, and that's usually a pretty good uh, indication that I need to put my shoes on and get out for a run. Um, but yeah, the day to day is, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, I'm trying to figure out, I, it's, it's constant reinvention. So some days it's like, I feel like I accomplish so much um, whether that's on an artistic level, photographs, um, writing, um, coming up with ideas, figuring out ways to execute those ideas. And then other days it's like virtually nothing at all. But what's important is having the time and the ability to, uh, to be able to do those things. Right. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question? I, I, yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I'm just, you know, I'm interested in, in, in like how, like there's a lot of, I think of you in a way that's sort of similar to someone like Laird Hamilton. Like he's created a life out of surfing that has nothing mm-hmm. to do with competition. Mm-hmm. And you emerged from the competitive sphere of ultra running to cut this very unique path that you own and only you can do what you do. Mm -hmm. And you've been able to create a living out of that, which is like an amazing thing. Like you get to basically do what you wanna do and pursue the projects that inspire you. And that's a that's a gift. That's like a that's like this rare liminal space that most people, you know, can't access in their lives. Right. Um, And so, I mean, you're, I mean, you're the product of a hippie parent, you know, like mm-hmm. you, were, you were sort of raised to kind of cut your own unique path, I suppose, in many ways. Um, but were there ever times where you thought like, I gotta get a job or like, you know, those moments of doubt or yeah. where your faith was questioned about whether this is really, <laughs> like, am I gonna be able to do this? Totally. Like, it's gotta be hard, Yeah, you know? And I, I think that almost every single day, yeah. should I get a job? Right. And it's and it doesn't- Have you ever had a job, like a I've had job? a lot of jobs. I mean, I've, I worked, uh, I waited tables for uh-huh. 10 or 15 years. I yeah. helped distribute Mezcal for a, uh-huh. a friend of mine for a little while. Um, I For a little bit there, I was delivering food in San Francisco on my motorcycle. Um, so I've, I've had lots of jobs and, and more often than not, these jobs are to fill my day mm-hmm. <laughs> a little bit and to meet people and, and to, uh, to, to pretty much to not be at home all day long right. and, uh, with, with running as my only outlet. Um, but in terms of running as a job, um, and these more recent projects, um, it's, it's something, you know, when I decided to run across the country a couple of years ago, um, it was, uh, yeah, it was just kind of a time in my career where, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to beat Killian Jornet, right uh, at anything. Like how many times are you going to tow the line at some big race? Exactly. Yeah. And, and like so many of these races, uh, I can tell you from experience, like it's win or lose. It's like, even yeah. if there's a podium, even if there's prize money 10 deep, it's, you, people only recognize that you've won or right. you've lost, mm-hmm. which is a shame, I think. Um, but it's also just kind of the nature of the beast. And so in that sense, uh, I decided like, I wanna start doing more project-based runs that possibly uh, inspire people in a completely different mm-hmm. way, in ways that I've personally been inspired. Right. Um, and so for that, it's been these, these two projects that we've been talking about. Um, I also put together a bunch of running trips. Right, hut, I, run, hun, hun, hut, run, hut, hut or run, run hut, hut, run. And then now I'm getting, con- <laughs> now I'm think? getting confused. No, uh, it's hut, run, hut. Hut, run, hut. Uh-huh. And bus, run, bus. Uh-huh. Um, so these are two. You're like kind of like running retreats, right? They're kind of running retreats, uh, running experiences. I'm still trying to find the right label for them. Um, but they, they're, they're small groups, uh, this hut to hut running trip in Colorado, um, goes from Aspen to, uh, a small town outside of Vail. And we stay at these, uh, secluded, uh, mountain huts, the 10th mountain huts, mm-hmm. which I grew up, uh, in Colorado maintaining when I was starting at 16 years old, I was going and doing trail maintenance for these huts. And, and, you know, we'd skied from hut to hut and we'd biked from hut to hut, but uh, there was never any trip that was a running from, from yeah. hut to hut. 
And uh, so six or seven years ago, I came up with this idea to, to do this and, and vehicle assisted. So all you need is, is your backpack, uh, a small running pack and, and, uh, and the ability to cover 15 to 20 miles a day, which I think right. is in most people's uh, wheelhouse and, and way more than people think. And so um, I've done, I think, 13 or 14 of those trips oh, wow. now. Uh -huh. I do usually do two or three a year and getting to meet people and see people sort of transform uh, during this week when your cell phone doesn't work and right. you're really challenging yourself and you're sleeping in at 10,000, 11,000 feet with not a lot of oxygen. Yeah. Um, it's really quite exciting. And so it's, it's kind of, for me, it's a, an opportunity to provide a little bit of my life and my philosophy for others. And, you know, I, I don't make people get rid of their watches uh -huh. for the week, but I, I definitely suggest that they turn them off and not pay attention too much. Just, uh, we're going to get there. So if you had to articulate that philosophy, what is it? Uh, fun over fast. Mm -hmm. That's, that's generally what I tell people. And, and, uh, that, uh, yeah, I, th I think that, uh, what it is, is, is really just tapping into something way more pri primordial that we've lost touch with a little bit. Um, this simple, you know, coming up with a simple goal and that's just to keep moving all day long. Mm -hmm. And then when we get there, we're going to eat and hang out and share some smiles and, um, yeah. It's, it is getting back to something really primal. And I think that speaks to another like hunger and thirst that we, that we have, you know, people are more interested in having those kinds of experiences now than going to a fancy resort totally. you know, and laying on a beach. Yeah. Like, how can I, how can I just feel more and, and, and feel more alive? Right. Totally. And we're so accustomed to, you know, being in offices and riding elevators and things like that, that we've, we've lost that connection. Yeah. And what's the bu the bus run bus thing? Is this a, it's kind of a different version of that? Uh, it's a different version of that. So I've got some history of, well, I've got a lot of history of road trips and a little history of, of river rafting. And uh, so I kind of consider it uh, the, the combination of those two things. Uh -huh. Being a traveler for the past 20 plus years, have known about uh, this bus company, Green Tortoise. Uh, out of San Francisco. They've been going since, I think, the early 1970s, 1973. Uh, the, the gentleman that started it converted a school bus and drove people from San Francisco to New York. And uh, he did the first one in like four or five days. Uh -huh. And then the second one he did in one week. And then the third one he did in three weeks. And he realized that the longer he went, the more people he could get to sign up for uh -huh. it. And so now, whatever it is, 50 years later, uh, he's, uh, his son and his grandson, uh, his son owns it, his grandson uh, is a driver, and uh, they have a fleet of five buses, and they run trips all over the place, all over the American West, up to Alaska, um, sometimes down into Mexico. And I'd known about them and I approached them and asked if they could charter a bus uh, and do this trip. Uh, San Francisco, Yosemite, Zion, Grand Canyon, Las Vegas, Big Sur, and back to San Francisco in seven days. Uh -huh. And the guy's eyes just lit up and he's like, that sounds amazing. <laughs> so basically you get a bunch of people, you sleep on the bus. You sleep on the bus. And you the drive buses. to a cool place and you run around and then you sleep and then go somewhere else. Exactly. Yeah. So the bus drives through the night. Um, so it's kind of, I consider that kind of like time travel. Uh -huh. uh, and you and wake up in a new place. You wake day. up in Yosemite and you go, you've got 10 hours to, to do a short run or 10 hours to do a long run, whatever it is that you feel uh, comfortable with. Um, that's pretty cool. So the first one was this past summer. Um, and we did it, that route that I just mentioned and I had 25, I think runners on the bus, two bus drivers. Uh, we covered, uh, one mile shy of 2000 miles. Uh -huh. Um, I think the, uh, the stronger runners covered close to 140 miles throughout the course of the week, including like a 15 mile run in Las Vegas. 
um, hitting as many restaurants as they could yeah. for the five hours that we were there. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was really phenomenal. It was uh, living in the American West, we have so much at our fingertips. Um, the issue is getting to all of them. And right. so solve that with uh, two bus drivers and and a bus load full of food and and uh, a bunch of uh, like-minded people. That's pretty cool. So next summer I'm doing, uh, I'll do two of those. I'm gonna do one up in Alaska, uh -huh. um, which wow. is really exciting. So we'll fly into Anchorage and fly out of Juneau yeah. and it'll be about 15 or 1600 miles on the bus. And uh, yeah, potential again of, of 100 to 150 miles running in all of those places. Um, through Amazing. some of the most beautiful terrain uh, in all of North America. Have you been up to Alaska before? I've I've gone up there five five or six years in a row now. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I rode my motorcycle up there um, six years ago um, to complete. That was uh, when you did you rode your motorcycle all the way to Patagonia, right? I, I rode my motorcycle to Patagonia when I was 23 years old. Uh, from Colorado, um, I have this tendency, this need to 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 do things a little bit differently. I'd gotten into a study abroad program in Valparaiso, Chile, in uh -huh. uh, Central Chile. I've been and, there. Uh, you have. Well, my wife is from Alaska, okay. but her mother is Chilean. Okay. From Santiago, but I've been to Valparaiso and yeah. the, some of the coastal towns around there. Yeah, it's incredibly beautiful. Yeah. And so I'd gotten into this study abroad program and and just living in or being being in school in Boulder, Colorado for uh -huh. uh, you know however many years you you get the college students coming back and mm -hmm. from their study abroad program and and I was just kind of hearing the same stories over and over and over again and I'm like all right I'm going to do study abroad but I'm going to do it my way I'm going to ride my motorcycle yeah. there <laughs> <laughs> and uh So this was a full 10 years later, I wanted to complete the two continents. So I rode my motorcycle mm, up to Alaska, to Alaska and then ran the uh, Mount Marathon race up there, which is uh, uh, part of the reason that I I don't race all that much anymore is because that race I consider to be the best out of any race that I've ever done. Really? Pretty much in the world. Why is that? Um, It's dangerous. It doesn't have a set course. It's extremely competitive. It's got a lot of history. Um, there's uh, equal emphasis on the men as there are, is on the women um, mm. and on the juniors for that matter. Um, and it's just a, it's an incredibly huge celebration of who we are as Americans and who we are as athletes. It's really something That's else. That's cool. And it all happens so in five can, kilometers. So nothing can match that, so you're just not. <laughs> it's hard. I don't know yeah. how to say it. It's like, it's hard. It's like, I love, I appreciate all of the races out there. I appreciate that there's these races and I appreciate that um, that people have something on their calendar to, to train for and to look forward to. Um, but after running up and down a mountain in Alaska, like the idea of training to run you know, this contrived route around a bunch of ski trails on a ski right. mountain, because that's the only place that we can get a permit to run a race here in the lower 48. Um, it just doesn't do a whole lot for me. Yeah. Um, like I said, I, I, it, uh, I'm glad that they exist, um, but I, I need something right. I, I'm substantive to, to kind of feed my my desire to race. Yeah, what's the point? I mean, you, there's always somebody doing something crazier too. Mm -hmm. Like how many times can you run the bad water course in a row or totally. you know, the seven marathons on seven continents and these are expensive affairs. Mm -hmm. And your whole thing is like that's great, but let's strip it away and we're, and find the meaning in all of this. And the meaning yep. comes in those human connections that you have by just being in your backyard. Yeah. Like it doesn't need to be more complicated than right. that. Right, yeah. One of the things we didn't talk about is the fact that you lived in Antarctica for a while. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. a while ago though, right? When, 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 how old were you when you were there? Uh, that was about, that was right when uh, Liz and I started dating. So that uh -huh. was uh, maybe nine years ago. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky she's still in my life. I, I left frequently for several months at a time. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, well, so, you're just, this is who you are. Yeah. And so this was uh, like, Ant I, I had read which book, I mean, every everyone that's been to Antarctica has one book that spoke to them more than the others. And for uh -huh. a lot of people, that book's Endurance and other people, it's another book. And for me, it was this book called The Worst Journey in the World. And mm -hmm. you would think that would uh, have the opposite effect. Right, instead this magnetizes you. Completely. And so this was uh, a journey in 1906 or 1907. Um, and it was it was the Scott journey where he ended up going to the South Pole and dying on the way back. This was written by uh, the youngest person on his team that stayed at camp. And so, um, and so he was there in Antarctica for right. two years. And I'm like, I, I got to go. Two years. Yeah. And yeah, two very long winters. Um, and so an ex-girlfriend of mine, her ex-boyfriend uh, worked in Antarctica and I just asked him like, how do, how do I get a job there? And he says, yeah, what sort of skills? Yeah, you can't just go. You can't just go no. to the South Pole. Yeah, unless you got a lot of money. And then you, even then you still can't stay for that long. Uh -huh. um, and so he's like, so what, what sort of skills do you have? And I'm like, I don't know. Uh, he's like, carpentry? I'm like, nope. He's like, kitchen? I'm like, sort of. He's like, dishwashing? And I'm like, I can wash dishes. Uh-huh. And so that's what I did. I went, I, wow. it's the, the hardest job I've ever gotten in terms of interviews and, and physicals and all of these things. Wow. Uh, but yeah, I, I got a job at the South Pole. I was on the first airplane to go there for that season. It was October 12th, um, must've been 2009 or 2010 and stuck around there for four months, washing dishes, six days a week, 10 hours a day. Um, ran two races while I was there. That was a huge part of the reason that I wanted to go. There's a race called the Race Around the World, which takes place on Christmas Day um, ever since the 1970s. And it's a two and a half mile race that goes around the station and right. and uh, and pretty much everybody participates, whether on foot or on snowmobile or on snow bikes or, or whatever it is. Some people tow couches behind the snowmobiles. Uh, uh -huh. it's, it's just a parade around the station. It's an right. excuse for everybody to get out. Didn't you um, create a new course though? I did, yeah. And so when I arrived there, they were doing three laps, uh, three, like three quarter mile laps around the station. And I'm like, but the station's so much bigger than that. Like, how come we don't go out to that, you know, station or that uh, building or that building or out to the berms or out to those you know, the, the ice tunnels out there. And the woman that I asked about it, she handed me a map of the station and said, go ahead, right, you do <laughs> design it. the course. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so I designed a new course there. Um, Just one broader one loop. big One big loop, and it was awesome. It, mm. it, you, you know, it went all around the station, really cool. Every time zone. Every time zone, yeah. And then uh, the winner of that race, you... Uh, the, the the award for the man and the women that win the race is that you get a free trip to the edge of the continent to McMurdo Station in order to compete in the marathon there, which is again only open to employees and it's they usually get maybe 40 or 50 people to run it. And on the day before that we're supposed to fly to McMurdo, me and this gal, uh, they canceled our flight. Um, uh, and it was just weather, just, just, no, it wasn't. It was bureaucracy. They had, they had, uh, they didn't need to any shipments to the South pole or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, they just canceled the flight. Like we're not, we're not a priority. The two, uh, skinny kitchen staff runners right. wanting to run the marathon, uh, on the coast, uh, was not enough of a priority. So we, uh, enlisted the help of a couple surveyors at the South Pole Station, and we designed our own uh, marathon course there at the South Pole Station, which was, again, one lap of what we had done, about two and a half miles, and then out to the the ice runway, which is two and a half miles long. Mm. And we did five laps up and down the ice runway uh, for Just hands you and, down. and one woman? Uh, we ended up getting, I think six or seven people started and four people ran the marathon from what I've been told, uh, it's still going to this day. And I think they get like 15 to 20 people competing oh, wow. in the marathon 
for hands down, quite possibly the most boring marathon course <laughs> in the world. <laughs> but definitely not the easiest. No. They should call it the Ricky Gates Marathon. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's amazing. So what are we looking at? Like minus 20? My, like what is the temperature range? It was, when I did that, it was minus, it was about, the, the wind chill was minus 40 and that was going one direction in the other direction. It was probably more like minus 60 because uh -huh. you're going <sighs> with the wind and then against the wind. How do you so, even gear up for that? A lot of layers. Yeah, a whole lot of layers. I had uh, big, uh, just like these guys, big earphones uh, plugged into what was back then an iPod. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just remember this one funny part, like, and, and huge mittens with uh, glove warmers in there. Um, I had my iPod on album shuffle and, uh, and I can't remember which album it was, maybe his greatest hits, but Frank Sinatra's greatest hits coming on. Oh my God. <laughs> and knowing so now that for the rest of your life, if you yeah, hear Frank Sinatra, you're going exactly, to that experience. Right? Straight there. And it was just, I, I know that it was too cold for me to take my, the, the iPod out cause it would have right. frozen immediately. And then I would have been without any music. So wow. yeah listen to, I, can't, I think I'm one of the few people that have listened to an entire Frank Sinatra album while running a marathon. <laughs> I don't know. There's probably a few others. Yeah. But I had um, Colin O'Brady in here sharing about his solo adventure across Antarctica, pulling that sled. Yeah. And he was saying that he had to be very careful about how he expended himself. Like you have to create mo momentum to pull that sled but if he overexerted himself or went too hard um, and started to sweat, like sweat is death. Like totally. you can't sweat. No. So how do you run a marathon with all these layers on and avoid that death-defying pitfall? Yeah, well, you can't run very fast, that's for sure. I uh -huh. ran, I think I ran 4.05. Um, and it's it, 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 there's no doubt about it, it's a delicate balance. Um, his situation was vastly different than mine. If I went into death zone, then I just ran into the galley mm -hmm. and got some hot chocolate. <laughs> right. He didn't have that opportunity. Right. But but, yeah, I, but as soon as you start sweating, it freezes immediately. Totally. Right? And it was fascinating. Like, and that's when I experienced it the most was during that marathon was taking my jacket off and there was actual um, like snow, it's, it's called hoar, H-O-A-R, inside uh, your jacket, just all of this frozen wow. uh, moisture. And uh, yeah, it's not something that you want uh, to, to happen if you're, if you're out there for multiple days uh -huh. or even like a, a really long day. Yeah. Yeah, it's deadly. So what was the idea going to Antarctica? Like what were you trying to learn? And did, just, did, did that experience satisfy that? Totally. It was two different things. I, I think that there's no place on earth that's more like a different planet than Antarctica. Um, so for me, it was like, if I wanted to ever go to space, this was my opportunity to go to space. Um, and then the other part is, is meeting and talking to all of the people there that were equally as interested in going to this other planet as me. Uh -huh. um, it's just kind of funny, The uh, everybody, it seems like everybody goes down there with a copy of Dune. And, cause it, and then when you get there, it feels very much yeah. like this desert, like it's the driest uh -huh. place on earth. It's 10,000 feet, the South Pole's at 10,000 feet. It's pancake flat. Mm. There's a, like, without the stations there, you're like human beings can't exist. There's no life form at the South Pole with the exception of humans. Yeah, I remember we got our our fruits and vegetables in from uh, New Zealand uh, at one point and there was a ladybug and the lettuce and the ladybug went straight into a jar and, and it was the station pet for the next uh -huh. three months. It was incredible, wow. yeah. And everybody visited the ladybug yeah. that was down in the little greenhouse. Um, but it's just an interesting uh, assortment of people. You get a lot of people like myself who are travelers and they wanna uh, visit the world. You get some some old crusty Antarctica people that are uh, you know, lifelong employees to the program. And then you get a few uh, blue collar people as well, um, you know, working for the contract company. Back then right. it was Raytheon, back then it was Raytheon and now, I don't know if this is still current day, but it's uh, Halliburton now, so is huge. Really? What are they studying down there? Um, they're studying things very, very big and very, very small. 
So they're studying neutrinos. This is the Ice Cube program. Um, and so this is uh, a really amazing uh, scientific experiment where they've drilled 80 or so holes into the ice plateau and, and put these little detectors, DOMs, uh, into the ice uh, that can actually detect when a neutron collides, a neutrino collides with the nucleus of an atom and creates a small explosion. Whoa. And so that's, uh, that's the things that are really, really small. So these are, uh, they're actually capturing this explosion. The neutri neutrino goes through the planet Earth and then collides on the opposite side. So that's how small they are. Wow. Yeah, it's hard for me to really that's, even yeah, like, comprehend I don't even, this. I, don't, yeah. I, I can't even totally. begin to and understand it, what that's yeah. about. But. And I had like several different people uh, dumb that down for me in a lot of different ways. And that's that's the best way that I understood that. Uh -huh. And so then they've also got uh, some incredible uh, telescopes uh, looking deep into outer space uh, for dark matter. And then uh, it being the cleanest air, supposedly the cleanest air on planet Earth, um, they also study air quality. NOAA is there mm -hmm. uh, with the station. Wow. Um, the stars at night had to be unbelievable. There was no, so when I was there, I was there for the summertime. Uh, I watched the sun revolve around right, in the so sky no, for four months straight. Right. You, no yeah, no I never, Yeah, I never saw the How darkness. How does that fuck with you? Uh, I had a room uh, with no windows in it. And I simply put it into my head that when I was going into my room, it was nighttime. Yeah. And She'd stick to a schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Also, don't they like drill these ice cores and pull them out and they're like time machines, right? Because they literally, they're so layered. Yeah. Like you're a tree, going like the rings of a tree, like you can go back in time. And... 170,000 years is right. how far you're going back when you're going uh, that far deep into the ice. And so you're looking, you're looking at explosion, uh, volcanic explosions. Right. Yeah. It's really incredible. One of the things I was reading about was with the the um, receding water levels and the melting of, of the ice caps is that it starts to expose like this um, water and ultimately vapor from so long ago. And mm -hmm. they don't know what's in that. Like there could yeah. be viruses and bacteria that mm. haven't been on earth for hundreds of thousands of years. Totally. That could create all yeah, kinds yeah. of <laughs> strange sci-fi movies yeah, yeah. type situations. Yeah. That's a trip though, man. Yeah. So how do you, now you're, you're married, you're working on these books, yeah. um, but you're a creature of wanderlust. Like what's mm -hmm. what's next and how do you satisfy that itch and what are you yeah, looking so at now? I'm still coming up with uh, more projects. The project that I have right now that I'm most excited about, which is gonna take me a couple of years, uh, at least two years, um, I'm calling the 50 Classic Trails of North America. Um, and this is kind of purely up to me. This is uh -huh. sort of based off of a book from the 1970s called The 50 Classic uh, Climbing Ascents of North America, and uh, where these two rock climbers went around uh, Canada, Mexico, uh, United States, and, and found these just totally iconic uh, rock climbs, some of which have only been done one time. Um, so for me, this is... Uh, I want it to be a little bit more attainable to the general public, but I do want it to be uh, something that uh, a runner uh, can strive for. Mm. So the the parameters for this are that I can tell somebody with confidence that this trail is worth traveling to and, and making uh, a weekend or a week out of it. Um, Another parameter is that it needs to be done in, in 24 hours by uh -huh. the fastest runners or hikers. I'm, I'm, I'm tentative of, about calling it a running specific book. Um, and then that it really covers all ecosystems. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all 50 of them, but just a few of them. Uh, there's a couple obvious ones. The, the rim to rim to rim in the Grand Canyon is, is an all time classic uh -huh. and, and needs to be included. The Lost Coast in Northern California, uh, 40, 50 mile point-to-point uh, -point run through the uh, most uninterrupted coastline in the lower 48. Um, the one that I've done most recently up in Alaska, the Chilkoot Trail, um, going from Skagway up into uh, British Columbia, which was used for a couple years for 
the the gold rush uh, to get people into the Yukon, uh-huh. uh, but then they built a uh, a railroad which which bypassed it. But it's a thirty, I want to say a thirty two mile or thirty four mile point to point run, which goes from this incredible uh, coastal jungle essentially uh, up into this high country and then down into a much more arid wow. uh, um, Canadian landscape. Um, so the idea is to kind of uh, a, a few different things, look at a bunch of different ecosystems, uh, provide people with uh, hopefully some inspiration to, to check out some new terrain, mm-hmm. um, illuminate some, some human history uh, ideally, there's a bit of human history with each of these trails, and uh, and really provide something. Uh, I, I call it running beyond the bib, uh, yeah. providing people with inspiration to to do a trail that's not necessarily a race, right? And to give them a goal that isn't necessarily a, an FKT or a record, but uh, you know something that uh, that they can look at and and feel like they, they can accomplish. And this is a book that you're doing? It'll be book. Uh, like, but like vi- like, a, like an art book, like visual, very visual. Totally. And, yeah. yeah. So this will be book, website, and uh-huh. uh, ideally one minute long per trail, uh, little video Videos. segments. Yeah. Like Atlas Obscura for trail Yeah, riding. totally, yeah. That's yep. pretty cool, I yeah, like that. Yeah. I got to get that guy to to help illustrate. Um, I like his illustrations. You have a lot going on. Yeah. You have, like <laughs> like it's it's cool. I just I think I just what I really connect with about what you're you're about is just is the sharing part. Mm. You know, like how you're taking this thing that you love and and creating like tactile objects and inspiring people to, you know, infuse their lives with the things that have brought so much meaning to you. It's really cool. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's uh I I hope that it uh I hope that it reaches people out there. I, I know that I, I constantly need um, the things in my life to evolve, and I don't need to change those things necessarily, or or like switch out running for uh, whatever skydiving or something. Uh-huh. But I do need for 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 it to evolve uh, to to help me with who I am today and who yeah. I'm becoming tomorrow. Well, cool, man. I think that's a good place to (laughs) end it. Um, Super amazing. Thank you for sharing today. Uh, Transamericana coming to a film festival near you and hopefully a digital platform at some point. I was very moved by it. You guys did an amazing job on that movie. So congratulations on that. I can't wait for people to see it and enjoy it. Thanks so much. And what's the book going to be called? The book is going to be called Cross Country. Uh-huh. And it's being published by Chronicle Books out of San Francisco. And that'll also be out in April. In April. Cool. Yeah. And rickygates.com. Yeah. Definitely go to his website. Like it's re- it's a cool experience to just get lost in all the content there. It's very cool. And uh, you're an easy guy to find on social media too. <laughs> um, amazing photographer as well. So definitely subscribe to your, your, your uh, Instagram page, Ricky Gates as well. Awesome. Anything else? Uh, that's about it. I hope to share the trails with, with people, uh, um, hut run hut, bus run bus. I, I, uh, I love providing these experiences and sharing them, uh, with others. So cool, man. Yeah. I want to go on one of those trips. Please do. Uh, yeah. yeah. You and I have a mutual friend, Heidi Zuckerman. Oh, you know, Heidi, that's yeah. right from Aspen. Totally. Oh my goodness. And she was interested in, uh, in a hut run hut and, and uh, I'm still working on her. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. Well, I want to go irrespective, but if yeah. Heidi's going, I would love to be able to to join her at the same time. That yeah. would be really fun. Yeah. Um, she just left the the museum in Aspen, didn't she? She did. She's she go back to New York? Uh, I don't know where she's gone, um, but I, I think she's, I, I don't doubt that there's a little bit of finding herself right now. Uh-huh. Uh, that's, that's, uh, must be very exciting. She was at the Aspen Art Museum for 14 years yeah, for a and, long time. and created a really incredible uh, program there, new building. Um, it's, uh, I can say this as a person that was born and raised in Aspen, that like sh- sh- her impact has changed the face of the town for the better mm. and, the, uh, and deeply cultural. 
Yeah, she's a very cool person. So, hey, Heidi, I'm sure you're listening. <laughs> she might be listening. <laughs> anyway, um, cool, man. Well, to be continued. And and again, I just want to extend an invite for you to come back and talk about the book when when that's coming out. And cool. maybe we can go on a run that time too. Awesome. All right? Sounds great. All right. Thanks, Thanks so much, Ricky. Rich. Good talking to you. Peace. Running. Oh, 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 oh,